All right, boys, how we done? Hello. All good? All right. Cam stitched us because we, we, he joined us the last ones because he was a... Uh, he couldn't happy clap. And now he could happy clap and he's patched us. So, here we go. Typical time, isn't it? A part-timer. I think he just got about Livingston's demise and their upcoming <laughs> relegation that will be confounded and confirmed in uh, Tencastle next Saturday. I heard he was on a Hindu. Oh, I actually that was true. <laughs> he's got a civil partnership, isn't he? He's getting married at next weekend. Right. Uh, <laughs> died to some sort of cabbage. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Right, Kev, what's been happening? How are you? Hey, I'm not too bad, mate. I'm just back from doing some work over in Europe. If he makes it sound really be, you know, better than it actually right. is. But uh, no, nah, it was just Berlin. Nice. Decent. Decent. And though, what's been happening? Well, yeah, well, it's been a few weeks um, since I've been on, but similar. I was over to uh, uh, Germany on a on a social jolly, which was uh, which was decent. And then when I came back, um, I caught... Tender. What's that? Hi. <laughs> oh, it might as well have been. The um, I caught um a twenty twenty one disease. Oh, sorry, twenty nineteen disease called COVID, and I was stricken with that oh, for right. a wee while. But uh, I'm back to full strength now. So, hi, uh, looking forward to getting going. Every time's got Vlad flu. Since we're talking about historic colds, remember I, I missed the good old days of Vlad flu. Because on Saturday, Kev, by ten to two Saturday afternoon, Shankland would have been. <laughs> Vlad Flood went to that would have been the that would have been the rumour mill as we were waiting to get into Paisley. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. It would have been uh, definitely on the fax machine. Do you say yeah. the fax machine? I don't know, probably somewhere. <laughs> we had uh Belter waiting in the queue to get in on uh, Saturday and obviously Storm Kathleen or whatever it's called, boy in front pulled his ticket out to go in the wind absolutely blew it out of his hand <laughs> and gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, and it wasn't salvageable. It was proper, like gone. And he's like, "Oh, he had to go to the steward and be like, uh, my ticket blew away. Can I get in?" <laughs> Needed everybody in the queue to be like, "Okay, to be fair, it, this ticket did blow away." But I was like, "Wait." <laughs> <laughs> well, that was about as entertaining. Yeah, you're, you're the worst kind of. Saturday. You're the worst kind of dickhead when it I comes to that stuff. Guy, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're the worst guy that you want standing next to in that house. <laughs> <laughs> Zero sympathy. Yeah. It, was, it was hilarious. Funny though. Uh, right, cool. Well, another episode, boys. Another Hearts win. Double digits for away wins. Got third pretty much sewn up, but we'll talk about that. We'll go through how the, the top six is sort of taking shape, etc., etc., as we head into the, the, la- the, the last round of fixtures before the split. Talk a bit about the semi final, obviously looming and tickets and one final push for, for trying to get this to be a sellout. Uh talking maybe a bit about the stipulations of games after the split. Pretty much had it not confirmed, but one of the meetings I was with with the club recently kind of said that if Dundee make the the top six because of the imbalance of home and away games, etc., we will have a third trip to Dens Park uh, this season. But that's if they can even get their games gone. Their pitch looks like an absolute travesty. <laughs> I mean, we'll talk a bit about that. We'll obviously review the game for Saturday. Uh, St Mirren 1, Hearts 2. And we'll look forward to the last home game before the split against Livingston as the Levy Lions come to Tincastle to have the relegation confirmed. And Tam's friend that made that very fun and laughable video of him playing the piano singing about Hearts Demise will be viral on Hearts Twitter as we remind him that you should never ever laugh at Hearts because what stays on the internet or what happens on the internet stays on the internet and I am the most better person on planet Earth and you better believe I remember every single person that's ever kicked us in the teeth. We've got that to look forward to. And um, we've got a time down as well with Kev. Anything else, boys? Uh, no, just one thing, um, and you've already said it once, um, and I, I don't know if you're supposed to lean easy on this, but uh, you're not supposed to say etc etc all the time now. The, oh, I've already. You've said, said it. it already, man. No, no, the, no. There's a, a Laura Campbell. I apologise. I am sorry. There you I go. Try my best I was going to say there was a young lady on Twitter who complained about her uh, enjoyment of the podcast being spoiled by you saying that. So uh, that's fine. I, I'll be honest. I, 
I didn't know. I couldn't remember her name, but there we go. I would like I, t- I said in the the community chat the other day that for the people that care or want to see about ten years ago, I, f- I was on a program on BBC One called Don't Get Done in the Jesus Sun. Right, mate, this is amazing. Right, I, I have actually <laughs> I, right. I'm coming to find this. What what TV company was it? It was, it was Flame Television or something like that. It was called, but it was for the B, It was for BBC One. It was like seeing the afternoon right. when like Holmes under the hammer and that. So mm-hmm. and Dom Littlewood does all shows like, oh, your granny got robbed at Tesco and all that type of Aye. those programs. That was one day after the my injury at the Scottish Cup final. I was sitting with a broken leg in the house <laughs> and it watched one of them and it came up saying, if you've had a bad holiday story let us know and I emailed in and so they did a full episode on us but the relevance to that is that when I was speaking every time I went to say fuck shit or bugger I was like oh I'm on the BBC I can't swear so I said "Uh, apparently (laughs) Uh, that was my like that was my that was my go to not to swear and since we're trying to make money on YouTube etc etc is me now trying my best not to say fuck cunt shit or piss so <laughs> i am sorry laura i am trying and there goes this episode's revenue right up the swanny fucking <laughs> hell no just just go beep, 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 beep. people know what's people know what's happening ah but so they've been relying on Tam to do the video edit for this and he's, he's, oh, he's useless as fuck so right, what's the point um the only one thing I was going to say about that is that I'm glad that it was aired on the BBC because the BBC archive absolutely everything and the all I'm pretty sure all it's going to take is £10 in a stamped addressed envelope to BBC High Towers and they'll send me the DVD of the full episode because I, I am well, desperate I to see it. The DVD, so. Have you? Well, yes! I'll send, the details. send it to I'll, me. I'll we'll get it in the YouTube. It. I've got the details. <laughs> it was like, uh, found it. They did the pure... Uh, everything was like, right, sit on the edge of the bed and watch Alana put her makeup on. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> why? Why would that ever be do regularly? <laughs> They were like, "Oh, go out a walk, walk around your house." I was like, "She's not a dog. Like, why am I walking? Why are we walking around the park? Like, what, what are we doing?" But it was. Uh, I got a free cruise and a free haul. So, the things you've got to do. So just to let you know, it's uh, episode two of ten uh, currently showing. No, on that the... one. Is that no you? That's no them. No, that's no the archive ones. I don't know why the, there was another. There was another hang in it. Uh, but the last time I checked for it because I was telling this story to someone else I don't think it was on like YouTube or anything like that I don't say sorry this but episode's anyway. not currently available but uh, it does say uh, that Fiona and Rani here from two people who were let down by their high street travel agent actually uh, just was now just as a dovetail was there, was, yep. there was a clip of um, said TV show put in our WhatsApp group, uh, community chat and uh, by the way for anyone that's listening if you're not there get involved link will be in the description plug. Um, there you go it's almost like we're semi-pro at this now then however the person that shared the clip um also was able to show the full name of that video on youtube which is corbett and alana's wedding video so all uh, it takes is a quick google true. search and you'll see corbett and alana's we- <laughs> wedding video and it's got wow. it's got some appearances from uh, big bill the what? Yeah, he's got the old dad. One of my favourite old guys ever. Um, Corbett's ma. The has got Jamie and uh, Bike Speed Andy. There's uh, there's there's a few folk in there. It's uh, it's worth watching. The I've uh, I've went and back I'm, and I watched the full thing. It's great. There's <laughs> another tangent. It was because the idea of Andy or Jamie standing up and doing any form of speech was terrifying. So I was like, right, that's not happening. So will they? A video and we'll try and control it so that was why that is why that exists think, but you can watch it if you want it's... i think you've let jamie down a wee bit there i think uh Jam- yeah, but, jamie would well, have been jamie's good. jamie's stories are fine well no fine they would have been absolutely horrendous <laughs> i would never have got married but andy <laughs> andy's stories would would have bored the room to tears like so it will be fine but anyway uh, let's move let's moving on right. liam corbett uh, life life story thing. <laughs> Da, 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 da. I'm gonna get this is your life music pit over the top of it class. I I forgot about that program. Mm. I forgot. I was wondering where you were going with the theme tune. I was like, what's this all about? I'm sure that was right. It. Anyway, never mind. Let's get back to let's get back to hearts headlines. Uh, uh, 
Saturday's win, double digits for away, away victories in the league. Is that the first time I think I've seen Sked put up for the heart standard? First time since what, 91, 92? Yep. Didn't see it Which myself, quite, but I've heard, yeah. Quite something to think it was that long ago. Yeah, for, you get an opinion on how or why you think that suddenly changed for us? Um, I think I think if you look at it from the point of view of just sheer confidence, um, I think we've got a, a bit of arrogance about ourselves, if I'm being honest. Um, and part of that is coming down to the fact that, and I mentioned this in, a number of weeks ago, and I think we've all mentioned it, that back line that we've got tends to be fairly solid. Um, and I think because everybody else knows that that back line is solid, that whether we're playing at home or we're playing away, we have actually got foundations to, to effectively build on and move forward. So I would go as far to say that, that some of that comes back on and possibly look upon it as a, a positive for uh, for Naismith and the way in which he's controlled things since that Rangers game back in, what, November, December time? I know, Ando, but the, we've probably been on podcasts <clears throat> where we've spoke about you know, things that Robbie Nielsen have said or whatever, but one of the things I like that sort of swayed me more so than the performances around Stephen Naismith is I like, talk, I like listening to him talk before and after games because there's no... There's no nonsense in there. I think he calls it pretty fairly. I think he calls it pretty fairly for both teams. He never sugarcoats it when it doesn't need that. He you know, praises when it needs to be praised. But one of the things I like about him is the fact that he, even sp- he spoke about this after the game on Saturday when someone asked him the question about the way wins. He said, you know, what I've known about that stat as a player and I've known about, like you said, within it, we had three league away wins last season. He's like, that's utterly pathetic for a heart side as big as us, and I think it's obviously something that all coaches and stuff probably talk about, but you do get a feeling that if Stephen Naismith relays a message to the players like that, that they seem to be trying their best to, to sort it out. No, definitely. Uh, I think this this all goes back to what he was like as a player. Right? It was an IPB sweetie and money and everything like that, and I, you can bet your backside to a barn dance that he's... Uh, if, <laughs> If that's a stat that he wants improved, he's going to be speaking about it week on, week on, week. Um, and there's going to be a cognizance around it and they'll take measures to address it. And that, I think, coupled with the fact that a lot of the teams in the league this year, and maybe controversially me saying this, are poorer than they were last year. Um, I think that, that probably also aids in our favour as well. So um, you've got a team that's striving for, for everything possible, trying to... Knock the uh, knock the stat on the head almost, and then everyone else being just that little bit more poor than they were last year. Well, Stephen, if you're listening, 19 attempts to beat Rangers at Hamden. There's a stat to keep talking about. We can put that <laughs> right in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I, 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 I'm not a massive buyer in here that the the league's any better or poorer than than what it is. I think it's uh, yesterday, for example. There's loads of mitigating factors and stuff, but you're you may be right in terms of we should be sitting here talking about how we're basically a one one or two away from three seasons in third. You know, last season we capitulated of all of our own doing and kind of and I keep saying this in the, the community chat as well, is that it's no coincidence that Aberdeen are a mess and Hibs are a bit of a mess. And if you go back to when we finished third under Robbie, not last season, but the season before, Hibs were a mess, Aberdeen were a mess. If we do our job, it doesn't just impact us on the pitch, etc., etc. It impacts Aberdeen and, and Hibs. They've been through three managers each since we turned the corner. You know, We were in the championship under Robbie Nielsen. Hibs finished third. They were flying. We beat them in the Scottish Cup semi-final when Jack Ross was there. And then we went on a run, ran it and squished third. They get rid of Jack Ross, brought in Sean Maloney, got rid of Sean Maloney, brought in Lee Johnson, got rid of Lee Johnson. Uh, Aberdeen had, what, Stephen Glass? Stephen Glass. Yeah, would have been. Then Jim Goodwin. Uh-huh. Then Barry Robson. Uh-huh. Now Neil Warnock. Now someone else. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, when, we, when we do our job, it doesn't just impact hearts, it impacts the... Impacts everybody else as well, so <clears throat> aye, 
It is impressive. Uh, I like that Nesmith talks about these things. I like that he knows these stats. Uh, and long may it continue. Like long may it continue. Talking of the top six since we're since we're here. Get any preferences to who, what, where, why, when, what that looks like. Be quite happy if it just stays as it is, personally. Um what that top six is at the moment would be probably what you would ask for. Um I know that Corbett, you would love to see a certain team stay in the bottom six. Um just for rubbing it in, salt and wounds and all that stuff. Um I think I, I think there's a lot going on next weekend though, isn't there? There's chances of teams taking points off others and if things work out, Motherwell could actually end up in the top six, which I think is a bit better. Uh, well, Andrew, that was one of the positives actually, because we almost had the perfect Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Dundee had managed to hold on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then uh, we would have had pretty much the perfect Saturday. But actually, I didn't realise the ramifications of Motherwell winning, which actually play in a uh, no our hands. Like you said, we've got bigger fish to fry than who finishes in the top six. But Motherwell play Hibs. At Far Park, that's you know. So now Motherwell with a very outside chance, but if Motherwell win and Dundee lose, then you know they could potentially sneak into the the top six, etc. So it means that Hibs are going to have to go and put on a performance. They're going to going to have to get a result. And so far this season, when they've needed results like Saturday, you know they're at home and they need to go get a victory. They can't do it. Uh, <clears throat> I listened to uh, some of the BB, uh, the BBC's coverage on Saturday, and I think it was Alan Preston had said the same thing, um, which was like Montgomery hasn't had a statement victory since he's taken over at Hibs, and that that is absolutely fair. They, um, they could have uh, done that with a win against St Johnson. Uh, in a tight spot on Saturday, didn't bother doing it, they, um, and I don't think there's any confidence. Uh, amongst the the Hibs fans just now that they could get that against Motherwell either. Um, if I'm being honest, I think uh, just to go back to your original question, any preference on who uh, I would have in the top six, I'd be quite happy with Kelly, St Mary and Motherwell. Um, only because Motherwell's closer. It's a decent away day. Um, if indeed we are away at home, I'm not sure what the balance is um, on the, you know, the three versus four or whatever. Dundee's horrible. It's a tight field. Miserable fucking place. I hate going there. Um, so, yeah, come on, except Mary Motherwell. That would be my preference, if I'm honest. Yeah. And remember, don't discredit some of the great victories Montgomery's had. They had the 2-2 draw at Tynecastle. That was a big, big win for them. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. And then remember, they got beat 2-1 by Celtic. At <laughs> so that was a massive That was a massive win for them as well. <laughs> remember, they were, they were big, big results in the calendar for them. Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, I'm a same <laughs> The, my worry is again we go back to stats, right? If we're uh, we're talking, I uh, touch with about. I was going to go around and say is Ford done, uh, but I think realistically there's 18 points left, six games left to go. Kilmarnock essentially have to win every single game, which would include beating Celtic and Rangers, beat us. Uh, I think even if we if the wheels came off the season completely and fell apart, I think Hearts are. I think Hearts are third. Uh, Anybody disagree? No, absolutely not. I think uh, it, while it's not mathematically assured yet, um, that doesn't really matter. I know I gave jip to somebody in the community chat the other night about it, but then um, it, it would it would take a monumental collapse. It, it would be the it would be the biggest collapse in probably the club's history. Like I, I know what happened last year uh, with the run-in versus Aberdeen, slightly different. Then um, it's just not going to happen. End of. So third is ours. It's yeah. done. Well, you've just become the commandant guy that's going to be the levy guy for us when the piano in it. Absolutely. <laughs> when, Absolutely when fine. I'll, I'll own it. <laughs> I'll own it. It's fine. <laughs> That'll be a good that be a good laugh. But I think in all seriousness, I think big one yes and we'll talk about the game, but it was a big one yesterday for Hearts. Uh like I said, you know, you'll be sick of hearing me say about it, the Hearts are a streaky team. Uh, and that was a good good win to get the ball back on the positive side of the road with Livingston coming to Tencastle as well. So I'd like to see us go into the, the top six with a bit of swagger. Everybody as well publicised how poor we are in the top six if we are to, 
do anything in the semi-final, if we're to do anything, if we potentially get to a final, we need momentum and we need to go put some markers down against the, the teams in and around us, etc. Sorry, Laura, I'll not say, I almost said etc, etc. Mate, you've said um, it so about tw- 20 times already, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's having a shot of tequila every single time you do it. She's gone now, she's absolutely pissed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, talking all of the semi-final. We just, it's, it's, there's nothing to talk about other than if you're in a place to do so, buy tickets. Yep. We need, uh, as it stands now, we've got three big empty sections right behind the goal. I won't have you, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, not what Not you, Andrew. Don't, you don't buy a ticket. You're not allowed to buy to go. it. You can okay. buy a ticket, but just don't go. <sighs> Are we still on this? Are we still on this? Well, what today is, come to the game on Saturday, where it doesn't really matter when we're at home to... Levy, and if we win, <laughs> by six. then you can go to the semi final. Uh, if we win by six, then I can go. Then, unfortunately, no, no, just win. it's fine. You just got to break the cycle. See, this this is the pain in the ass. Is that unfortunately I can't even make it on Saturday. Like that's okay. uh, it's just not going to happen. So see at the final then. Oh fuck shit! All right, okay, fine, <laughs> fine. Bye, <laughs> These are in a position today, so genuinely, I know we spoke about it last week. I'll say it again. This is the sort of beginning of the the end game for the so called lesser clubs when it comes to these games. Celtic and Rangers, broadcasters, event organisers, they want the stadium full. And whether we like it or not, whether you kicked off at four in the morning, ten at night, on a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, wherever it may be. Celtic and Rangers have the pulling power. They'll bring 50,000 fans to that game because even if they're core group of 25 that say, I'm not paying that for that ticket and I'm not going to that game at that time and I'm not doing this, that they've got another 25 in the background waiting to get the chance to get a ticket. And then if they do the same, there's another 25. We, Hearts, have fought our corner here. I know this because I spoke to Hearts. Uh, I was part of the, luckily enough to be part of the conversation around how we should sell the tickets, how the, the tickets should be sold. Hearts had to fight tooth and nail. You know, they went to the table straight away to be told you're not getting a fifty fifty ticket split because you won't sell the tickets. Aberdeen said, Fair enough, we probably won't. Hearts said, No, we absolutely will. Or we want at least the opportunity to sell them. The event organizers and that said, No, uh, that's not what's happening. We want we don't want empty seats, it's a showcase final, etc. So they basically came back with a proposal as well we'll give you 50-50 but you got to pay for them and that's where we're at now the club will have to pay for the tickets that are unsold but also like Aberdeen who were told your historic ticket sales for these fixtures is poor your ticket allocation will reflect that if we then say we do win in the semi-final and there's three big empty sections at Hamden we won't even get the opportunity to have 50-50 for the final. They will give those tickets to Celtic uh, because they do not want empty seats at Hamden. And they'll double down as it stands now. I think Aberdeen have only sold 7,000 tickets out of their 18,000 tickets that they were given. So if we also have gaps in our, our side... This is, like I said, this is the opening gambit of them trying to say, like, you 50-50's gone. You, you, won't, you won't get it unless it's games not out, like, away from Celtic and Rangers. So we need sales yeah. tickets. We, we generally, there's, there's no if, but, ands, or maybe's about it. You have to buy those tickets. Uh, cool. VR, I actually put it down here, because it's had a bit of a, it's had a bit of a day today. I had a bit of a day yesterday as well, Kev. Uh, your thoughts on any of the VAR decisions over the weekend? Um, so from our game, because I didn't watch, I didn't bother watching any other club. Um, from our game, I thought it was a penalty straight out, but also I thought, I mean, you know what it's like if you're at the other end of the park. I thought it was a penalty for them as well, um, but it was just be- because it was the way in which the guy went down. So I did think whoever it was that was close to him had actually caught him, um, and. The likelihood is that it would have been overturned. I've now seen it back, and it's clearly not. So, you know, Who is it? One of you. Macaulay Tate? No, uh, Denham. Was... Denham, sorry. I, one of the young lads. Aye. Aye. Denham had came on at that point. Um, 
I can see where maybe St. Martin would maybe be a bit argumentative in regards to our penalty. But as I say, I, I thought it was straight away when I seen it. Um, well, <clears throat> I go back to what we talk about all the time is, what did the ref think happened for the Vargas shot? Because they hit the guy in head. So, Aye. You know, how, how did they miss it? How did they but miss it in is, real time? Yeah, this is something we've, we've discussed uh, many, many times on route to games, at games, during work, whatever, is the fact that at the end of the day, the referee of any game in Scotland is amateur. That's what it is. Let's, let's call it. And secondly, I don't believe that they want to make a decision on a football park. Yeah, I think I'd, I think they're, they're, I think they're more that. than happy just to say, "Oh, I didn't see it." What did you? What have you seen on on TV? What have you seen by watching it from from a, a box in the middle of you know the middle of Glasgow? What have you seen? Because I, I didn't I didn't see that at all. You know, we can go back. We should talk about the game at Motherwell with a penalty. The what could have been classed as high feet on Boyce. You know, there's, there's and that's just ours. You know, we know perfectly well there's other games as well and other clubs that have been impacted by this. Well, Andrew, that's what I was going to. I was going to talk about is the our the Leaf Globe Trotters across the city. How did they not get a penalty for the goalkeeper? The, the goalkeeper that wiped out the boy when it was nil nil in the first half. Aye. Like VR didn't VR didn't even look at that. I know. Or they cleared it. It's bananas. <clears throat> The, the, there's two things, right? So the, the well, in fact, there's three things. First one, Kev is absolutely spot on, and we've laboured the point on many professional revs in this country, right? And if that's the big overarching point, let's put that to bed. Job done. Second point is, I totally agree with Kev, is that they are reluctant to make an on-field decision because of the safety net that VAR provides, right? And the, why would you put your neck on the line? if the technology can clear you um and what if, i don't know what their performance metrics are probably fuck all because they're part-time but if you had professional referees you absolutely know that there's going to be a i know reports are done on the referee performance and all that sort of stuff but they're going to be held accountable so it's a case of yes we understand that var is there it's a safety net and all that sort of stuff but like you're not blind you're not running a bit with a white stick you should know and have a, a, a sight of what is happening in this game yeah okay fair enough you might get it wrong but to make absolutely no decision when it's clear and obvious is it, it it's, it's an absolute disaster it's gross misconduct if um if, yeah. if like if we were doing that in our work right someone comes to you with a complaint and uh, you do nothing about it if you don't do anything about it you're just as culpable as the guy uh, that has done the thing that's wrong in the first place, and that's where it's at for me. It's like it's, it was a, a good point, well made, Kev. When uh, I look at the instant, I think I'm going to say hearts were lucky, right? They weren't because I didn't think it was a penalty, right? But we were lucky that the ref was called to the monitor and stuck by his decision. You know, I thought that was pretty brave. It's almost every single time they're called to the. The monitor, like I say, it's got to be a clear and obvious error. But where I get frustrated about consistency is Shankland dived in the eyes of VR in the ref at Ross County. And the SFA upheld that decision to book him for simulation. The boy didn't get booked yesterday. The boy never got booked. So if it wasn't a penalty, it was a dive. So what one was it? Like it, it, there's just no consistency and it it boils my blood uh, you look at obviously the day in the old firm the boy is booked for diving rightly because it was a dive and then VR stepped in and said actually when you slow it down and you look and you look at all the little bits his foot might have actually touched his thigh when he was already on the way down and then they give the penalty and rescind the yellow card and I'm like it just, I there's no consistency. We've spoke about it a million times before. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kev. They take no responsibility on the park whatsoever. They are now just hoping that Glasgow picks something up and gives it so that they don't, they don't have to. That was a good point about the game today, though, because that absolutely fizzes my piss. Which is like, if if someone. Uh, like if, so, if if there is a wrongdoing and it turns out it is a penalty, they rescind the yellow card. But it never works the opposite way, which is right. We've given a penalty, uh, or sorry, we've not given a penalty. But this guy's just wasted five minutes at the time. Book him for it. 
Yeah. And also, did Dessers get sacked? Uh, sacked. Did Dessers get booked <laughs> uh, for the celebration when they scored and his goal that got chopped off? Pass. Okay. Don't know. <clears throat> that one's slightly I'm different left because the point. reason the the reason you get booked for that is like uh, taking your top off or whatever's inciting crowd trouble. Now the fact that you uh, it turns out not to be a goal doesn't get away from the fact that you've caused crowd trouble in the first place. So that one you wouldn't rescind for me. Well, what's but then I was but my my point was going to go back to Marley Watkins of last Saturday when he scored for Kamalnik and uh, went straight dumb, to section G yeah. and was standing in front of them. It's just not, like I said, I think the, your right overarching problem is that there's just absolutely zero consistency. Or accountability. It's interesting that you, you say that you know taking each top off was in slight trouble, but it's only the Rangers fans that were in that game today, so he wasn't even. It was. Do you know what I mean? No. That's, and he never, he never took his top off. Well, you know, but that's, he, went, that's he went into the crowd and he he took the he took the corner flag off and had the corner flag up, Kevin Kyle style away at Falkirk. Yeah. That's a uh, like yeah. I know there's no away fans there, but that's what it is in the rule book. It's inciting crowd trouble or yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's just a just a terminology. But yeah, I I think if even if you do take the top off and jump into your own fans, right? What's going to happen? Nothing. It looks, like, looks like he didn't get yeah, like that. Didn't they? No, no. I checked the details earlier. The reason I said did they get sacked is because, as we broadcast now at 10 to 10 on a Sunday night, the rumours are circulating that our friends have relieved their manager from the Leaf Globetrotters. Uh, Surely the rumor, no. But then, but then why would, why would there's no circulate? Although, actually... Every single one of them that I talk to are so deluded they think that he's an actual good manager. So, but anyway, that's, we've already talked about our, our rivals across the city. Let's not waste any more time on it. Cool. Great, boys. Let's stay. Uh, I think we've got a tan down with Kev. Go through that. Then we'll dive into St. Mirren and Levy. But first, let's plug our merch. Anybody that hasn't seen it, the I- iconic football top range. So on our Twitter if you've not seen it. We've done picked some of our favourite tops from, from down the years. Focus mainly on away tops. We'll, we'll maybe focus on some of the, the smarter home tops if we can get the design right. But uh, if you want them, head over, obviously. This is my story podcast. Uh, you should be able to find them, etc. There's a website that they can buy them for and You sure can. It's uh, thisismystorypod.com forward slash shop. Uh, and you'll find all the, the designs on there. Um, yeah, so... Very reasonably priced. Indeed. Indeed. Right, Kevin. <coughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. Tam down time. Um, you mentioned earlier on today that uh, Saturday's game uh, against St. Mern, uh was our 10th away victory of the season. And the last time that we'd done that was back in the season of 91-92. Um, just done a wee bit of detail there and found the actual team so we'll be looking for old school uh starting 11 and only two subs uh being allowed in this particular God. Uh, in this particular season um we'll let ando go first cool um i'm going to steal this one uh, henry smith <laughs> henry smith yes correct uh, henry started in goals that day uh, corbett well since i think i remember the game Potentially, I would have been six. So, apologies if it's wrong. I'm going to say Scott Crab. Scott Crab is correct. Do you want to mention the it's other correct. little detail that you might have just floated past Kev not five minutes ago um, when we were in the middle of a break? Was that actually was, was that actually true? Did Scott Crab score a penalty in that game? That's mental. That <laughs> that a six year old Corbett yeah. can remember that. Absolutely insane. You, all right. Um, cool. Wait, I think I know. Well, I've got the other one because I, I think I remember the score and I think I remember who scored the uh, Hart scored two. Well, so we'll, I think I know who scored the other one. Well, we'll come to that uh, in due course. Uh, in due course. <laughs> um, uh, back to you, um, Andrew. Well, because I'm dealing with an absolute superhuman when it comes to Hart's knowledge here, I'm going to play it safe uh, and I'm going to go with uh, Big Dave McPherson. Big Dave McPherson is correct. Right. Corbett. Uh, Tosh McKinley. Tosh McKinley, who I actually seen on Saturday. I seen him yesterday uh, at the game. Uh, back to you, Tosh McKinley. Nice. 
I used to be uh, sponsored by my uncle. There you go. Useless piece of information. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, I will go Craig Levine. Craig Levine is correct. Corbett's happy you've said it because he didn't. Know <laughs> <it>. <laughs> he's he's in my good books. Specky's in my good books after the result of the weekend and his post match interview. That was absolutely class. The heart grows fonder the further he is away from heart. <laughs> so I'm softening, I'm softening to him. But, uh, Fair. Uh, the guy with the greatest hair in football, Eamon Bannon. <laughs> Aaron Bannon was on the bench that day. So, yes, Gordon Corbett. Uh, this guy's hair was also quite good, for what I remember. It was kind of Corbett-esque. Uh, John Miller. John Miller, correct. John Miller scored the goal, didn't he? Aye. Did I get a bonus point for that without <laughs> even knowing it? No? Ah, yeah, okay, fine. Good try. Right, good try. Clear back. Try to work out if it was back in the weird days where... Did you? Did we said Dave McPherson, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we've said him. So did he play right back? So did that mean Alan McLaren? Alan McLaren, correct. Very good. Um, um tighter now, guys. It is a wee bit. Um, I'm just thinking back to the time frame. Ian Ferguson. <laughs> Ian Ferguson also on the bench, Ando. Right, okay. so you've got the two Ooh. subs from that particular day. How many have we got um, left to get? Corbett. Uh, only four to find. Okay. 1991. Who have we said already? Henry Smith. Alan McLaren, Tosh McKinley, Craig Levine, Dave McPherson, Scott Crabb, uh, John Miller, Ian Ferguson, and Eamon Bannon. Right. Ah, uh, okay. So, John Robert. Oh, you arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. I'll try to work it out, what, so yeah. Tosh McKinley would have played left. If Levine played, then he'd have played at the back with McLaren... Dave McPherson, right. And one other. Then, I'll just put you in your misery. Was it Gary Mackay? Gary Mackay, well done, Ando. There you go. Back to you, Corbett. How many have we got left? Get two, by my right. Uh, you've only got you've only got two. Two to find. One, I would say, was a striker. Oh, okay. No, then he gears in it. Uh... I'd love to see what YouTube would be, would be going on the night trying to work out these guys. Because there's only a, a certain clientele of our listening uh, audience that would actually know these particular a certain uh, vintage. years. We played Miller Holmes, wasn't it? It'd have been the Miller Holmes top with the, aye, with the Hearts aye. Our logo thing. Could have been the, with the, the Admiral one. Ian. Ian, 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 uh, Ian Baird. Oh, Baird. No, no. Ian Baird. Shithead. 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 Absolute shithead, you. Fuck off. So there's He's got one... Matt, do you not have curly hair? Does he have curly Aye. hair? Correct. <laughs> Ian Baird played that particular day. Um, one to find. So you're now getting Back to the... To you, Ando. You're getting to the bottom end, and there's, like... I, I, I don't mean bottom end in terms of quality. It's just, like, bottom end in terms of, I suppose, popularity. But... Uh, what position? Can you tell me that? You'll be going to position. Yeah, I would. I'd class him as a midfielder or a fullback. Could he played a couple of different positions for Hearts during those particular years. Okay. Um, I'm gonna George Wright. George Wright is correct. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Get in your hoops, sir. Oh, go on. Right. Now, the one thing that has it was really between him, me off. It was between him and someone else, right? But I don't know if he was... Te- I say technically there or not, right? It was between either him or Glenn Snodden. Well, I was trying to remember. I'm sure Magic Johnson broke through that season. <clears throat> 
potentially. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that, that was the season that Craig Levine banged that boy. Graham, Graham Hogg. Hogg. Uh, that was a that was a pre-season, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, pre-season of Red Rovers. Uh, stuck the head Starts up. Park. Uh, absolute Lambton one. Remember it. Um, well done, Ando, for getting that one. Right. Uh, well done for that. Um, That's going to be fairly like uh, that. In terms of... Aye, aye. What's the score? Oh, you got one more. Because it was 13. Me? 7-6. Seven, 7-6. Six. Seven, six. Right, taps off. I'm away run around the block. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Oh, shit. 7-6. Unreal. So there you go. There you go. Oh, I'm chuffed um, with that. It's uh, definitely an interesting one. It, Joe Jordan was, of course, the manager at the time. It matters more when Tam's uh, not here, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it would have been funny. It would have been funny to actually try and work out in regards mm. to with Tam, and that would have been hilarious to try and see who he was. But I think he would have got. Did we finish three. second that season, or was that this the nineteen nineteen ninety one season that we finished second? No, we would have finished second that season. To be honest with you, mate. Aye, because we were flying, weren't we? Aye. Because then the next few seasons were when we actually started to like really cause ourselves problems with relegation. Um, we had like Sandy Clark took over after Joe Jordan, and then we had Tommy McLean, which was even worse. Um, and everyone else with regards to that. Tommy, yeah, um, I didn't like him. Like, Couldn't they stick him? Nobody did, mate. Nobody did. Nobody and liked him. Jim Jeffries came in and saved the day. Certainly did, mate. Um, See, when you think of your yeah. life in terms of like Hearts managers that you've lived through, right? There's like for periods, it was just there wasn't very much change, and then obviously you get to your teenage years or your later teenage years, and it's just absolutely mental the amount of folk that you've got. I suppose it's a sign of the times uh, changing in modern football and all that stuff, but like I, I didn't care why, right? I, I, I like. And the, I'm turning at my dad when I say this. Is like I preferred football back then to what I do now, right? It's just it was just better. <laughs> Hi, I'm it's going to ask Big Bill. I, I'm sure I was at that game. <clears throat> I'm sure well, I was at right. that game. We did finish second that uh, that season behind uh, Rangers by nine points uh, oh, and yeah. one point ahead of Celtic, um, who came in third. And for any of you who wants to know, it was Dun United, Hibs, Aberdeen, Airdrie, St Johnston, Falkirk, Motherwell, St Mern, and Dunfermline taking up the rear. D- well, well, taking so up. Well, I was going to say that okay. escalated quickly. Then let's it? move on. Then, the one thing yeah, I was going to say, right, uh, what I would love to see, right, and there's nothing to do with is kind of something to do with Hearts. I would love to see a picture of Big Bill's hair back in the uh, 1991-92 season. I think he had. He used. Remember, was it Pat Sharp that used to do Funhouse? <laughs> That's right. Eh? That Don't he tell me? Yeah, he looked same like those pictures of the guy. He looks like he looked like Pat Sharp for Funhouse. Pat like. Sharp's mullet. Mm-hmm. That's class. Right. Oh, and then he went through that weird stage. Now everybody went through that stage in like the early nineties, where they look <laughs> older then than they do now. Mm-hmm. A bit like, like me. Pictures huh? of my dad. Like my pictures of my dad. We he really looks about eighty. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I, I like I like that that that's my peak peak hearts time was was those days there. Uh, right. Fair. Right there you my dog is desperately trying to get to be on the podcast. There we go. Sound effects included <laughs> for right. uh, everyone exactly. in Western Land. Molly Molly is here and on the podcast. Amazing. Uh right. <clears throat> ah, we should they made them because they're, they're 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 the peak. peak Forget years. about Tam, just because he's not a proper Hearts fan. Like they're the times right. that Hearts were. I loved Hearts. I, we had great great tops, great players. I normally do I these. It. It's not very it's often I take I, uh, actually take part in them. Um, but that was a good one, Kev. So well done. I'm, I'm not saying that just because I won. But I enjoyed that. Oh, we could do we could do uh, we could do definitely uh, mere Tam downs from the early nineties. Um, just to really piss Tam off. Love it. I, mean, I know he edits them, but what we could do is we could do a game and just put, like, see that static noise every time it cuts to Tam. So, like, Tam, it's you, and we could just have that. <laughs> <laughs> that is Tam's just like, uh, like, or the dial up internet connection. Uh, like, or the, uh, that, that static, like, in the ring film. That's what you want. Right? <laughs> Picks up the but phone. Ask him, like, who played for Levy in the season 2002 when they finished third. 
he'll be able to tell you every single one of them that played for him because he's a rat. Uh, cool. Right. So, we should name our tandems, like, uh, as we just said, but for the people that want to understand why I'm such a savant when it comes to hearts, right, this is genuinely, this is what Big Bill, this is what my dad got me for Christmas this year. For anybody that can't <laughs> see that, that is the 1976 Hearts team. Why? I've no idea. It did nothing memorable. It's got absolutely. You weren't even alive. Nothing to write home about. Oh, I can. This is the type of crap that he gets. But me. How can you relate to that team? Like, I understand. Well, well it's one. Oh, man. It's got Jim Jeffries in it. Fair. Jim Crookshanks in it, so that's good. Donald Ford. Busby. Donald Ford. Mm, Busby, yep. It's got Ralph Callahan, Willie Gibson, Don Murray. I don't know, it's David Clooney. I don't think it's got. No, it does me. Kenny Aird, Bobby Prentice. Oh, no, it's got Donald. Uh, Drew Busby, Donald Park. Donald Park, fucking hell. Park Ford, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> so that's the stuff. And when, my, when we used to have family parties, I'd have to sit and listen to my dad, my Uncle Phil, Duffy, whoever it was. Talk about, remember when Hearts played Montrose in 1973 in the East of Scotland <laughs> Shield or whatever? And I'd just, be, and I'd just remember it. I can't remember anything of any use that'll ever make me any money or make me anything other than this. But when it comes to Hearts, I'm an absolute savant and remember almost everything that happens. So there you go, just in case anybody wanted to know. God almighty. Right. Speaking of remembering, let's talk about Saturday. As... We headed to Paisley. I don't even know what it's called now. It used to be Love Street. It's no longer Love Street. It used to be like the CBD oil <laughs> macro fun pack 12 inch munchie box stadium or whatever it's called. I have no idea what it's called now. It's like SEMA or something like that. It's the SMISA, no SMISA Stadium. Aye. Which is, I always thought was a and popular anybody, brand of corner shop, but it's not. But there you go. Aye. If anybody, even the people that support St. Mirren, what is the tent that is outside the away stand? What is that? Why is that there? It looks like hanging out at ET. So was that no was that not what they were using for like when the weather was shit to go and do some sort of in, indoor training? Aye. Indoor training. <laughs> what in a car park? <laughs> Aye, but it was because you can inflate it was like an inflatable tent. I'm sure it was. Sure it was well, no like wonder it took it. them 40 years to finish in the top six twice. <laughs> <laughs> My anger came in and went, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're training in a car park car. In the tent out of ET. <laughs> it makes no sense. Uh, well, that's, it, it's probably so when like people leave, they can get their sort of, like, sanitation and like injections and all that. Well, for... it's, not even, it's not even inflated. It's not just a big tent that's on the ground. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's a, definitely a hazmat it's a thing. Weird, Got to be. It's a weird stadium. Anyway, so we went to St. Mirren. And to be fair to St. Mirren, I think one of the podcasts at the start of the, the season we spoke about, I think I said that probably St. Mirren and Dundee, outside of the old firm, have been probably the best teams that we've came up against this season. The first game at the Smisa or whatever it was, they absolutely battered us. That was when, I remember, uh, Hoff had to go for a job. I remember we played, <laughs> right. decided to play for nine minutes. Right. Nine minutes. <laughs> uh, eight minutes with only nine players or whatever it was, which was which was fantastic. <laughs> but they absolutely battered us. They had about four goals chopped though, remember? No. Yeah. Good laugh, so, though. I know we can laugh about it. I, I don't remember laughing so much at the time, but yeah, <laughs> we can laugh about it now. Kev... Obviously, me and, me and you were there. What was your thoughts at two o'clock when the team lines were uh, handed out? Well, I think probably like everybody else's uh, thoughts immediately were, why is there no Shankland? Um, you know, from that point of view, I think people had already known that both Hoff and Benny weren't going to play yesterday. I think that had been already discussed on... Press conferences on Friday or Thursday, whenever it was that uh, were discussed. I think people knew that they weren't going to be in the starting lineup or in the team at all. But I think the uh, the Shankland being uh, uh, missing from that uh, that starting eleven was probably the one that, that everybody questioned and wondered where it was uh, where where with that going. But uh, from what we've all heard, there was a 
there's a bit of a bug going through the club because um, I believe that's why Kingsley went off at half time. Um, the team itself. Uh, well, I think uh, Nesmith said really. after the game that he had been he had been struggling at the start of the week, but he, he maybe felt his hamstring a wee bit and just right. I think they just took him off for precautionary stuff. Obviously, learned a lesson for Frankie Kent when he played on in the, the derby when he probably should have probably should have went off. And though, like I kept right, I think everybody when the the team lines come out and you see that there's no Shankland. But again, it's. I suppose the positive is that the, the players that were there came in and ultimately done the job. Aye, um, I think like it, it, there's always a massive void um, whenever whenever he's not there, and that's just natural. It's always going to ha- it's always going to be that way. Um, but I, I I can't have any complaints about uh, the effort that was shown by uh, everybody else that that, that played uh, in his absence. I think it was. It, it's probably I think you, it might even have been you that put in the community chat. It's like it almost gives you a little taste of life after Shankland. And again, didn't want to get too much ahead of ourselves now or whatever. But it is good to be able to see that the team can function without him um, and can still get the job done. So I good. Yeah, I don't, I don't think probably the only other than obviously the the obvious exclusions for the squad. Kev is the, the only real issue I see now, really, game on game, is who plays right back or right wing back uh, between Dexter and Atkinson. Uh, what was your thoughts on Dexter on, on Saturday? Um, I, I'm, I'm still... I'm, the first couple of games you've seen him in, you thought, actually, he, this boy looks like he could be a player. Um, I don't think he's maybe got the hang of the Scottish game, if I'm being honest. I think because we do play maybe a bit quicker, you don't get as much time on the ball, so your your first touch has got to be virtually bang on the button. Um, and there's little things that he looks good going forward, but doesn't really look great as a defender. Um, but again, not understanding what my of him as I do, I don't think he's ever really been a defender. He's played various different parts on the pitch, but again, just to try and give him game time, I think he's probably parent club Wolves have actually put him in as a right back or, or right midfield um, so I'm a wee bit questionable about him just now but in saying that I don't think Atkinson has been playing great since he came back into the uh, into the team after the Asian Cup to be honest but there you go, that's my opinion Yeah and I, I, Listen, there's everything that we talk about for Saturday has to be under the, the context of just how Poor the conditions were. You know, the conditions were poor for both both teams, but I don't know if it come across on Hearts TV. But in the game, like genuinely, first half especially, you know, Xander Clark was kicking the ball out to the right wing, and the ball was going out for a throw in on the left wing. Like the wind was ridiculous, and any time the ball went up in the air, it made it so difficult to even kind of judge where the ball was going to go, etc. Which you've seen with the they almost scored directly from a corner in the first half. We obviously kind of pretty much scored direct from a corner in the second half. But the thing I think that summed it all up the most was just how difficult St Mirren struggled to get that display out before the game, Kev. That was hilarious, wasn't it? That was funny. That was funny. <clears throat> the boy who looked like John Robotham um, was, <laughs> was, trying to, was trying to help the, tell them how to vote today and everything else. Just like extend it out, extend it out. They couldn't they, because of the because of the wind. So I uh, that did uh, I think that amused everybody in the uh, in the hearts end to be honest. I did and that having had to have done that for the the heart and soul of Gorgie last week at Titan Castle, <laughs> I, I knew exactly how how painful that was. So to watch someone else suffer, and try to get that out made me made me giggle like it was hilarious. And then I also like that John Robotham tried to get to the away end after the. Uh, after they managed to get it unfurled and then got ushered away by the steward, which made me laugh as well. <laughs> but uh, I thought the first, I thought the first half was, I thought we played well. I think you kind of know. Again, it's one of the positive things I like about uh, Naismith and this Hearts team currently is that they kind of know exactly what they're coming up against. That never seems to surprise them, which is good. We've said loads of times before other Hearts teams have. Seem shocked that Livingston put ten men behind the ball, or you know, Derek McInnes plays in a certain way, etc. 
I can't stop saying that. It's so annoying. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I thought we dealt with it well. I thought we dealt with it well. I actually, I'm not just saying it because I know some folk on the the community chat had a bit of a pop or whatever. But I thought Vargas and Forrest were really, really good uh, on Saturday. Uh, I thought the first half they did everything that we would want them <laughs> to do, considering that we didn't have the ball over the top option, Kev. Uh, St Mirren could have and did try to put it into the channel almost every single time they got the ball because the ball just it just kept rolling and rolling and rolling and it made us have to defend it any time we tried to put the ball over the top on Saturday in the first half the wind just held it held it up so I thought they did brilliant to keep rotating and putting them under pressure Aye, and that, that was exactly what I was going to say the, the rotation element and the Ability for both of them to play one to play left, one to play right, and then swap over very quickly. Um, I think did cause St Mirren's defence a lot more, or asked them a lot more questions than their uh, front line asked of us in in the second half. Um, and I do think that you know Vargas and Forrest are very mobile; they're very quick on their feet. However, I did get a wee bit frustrated at Vargas uh, yesterday. At some points, he just didn't look like he was actually on his toes. And when I say that, I mean like in regards to reactions, he runs on his toes. You, you know, you, he's a little bit like a wee bit of a prancing horse at, at times. Um, but I think the problem Vargas had yesterday is, I mean, he must be about six stone when wet. And I think he was worried that the wind was going to blow him over. Um, <laughs> that was his biggest problem yesterday. I thought I actually thought Vargas did brilliant. He, he took the hits when he needed to take hits. He was up against Gogic, who turns into prime Zidane when he plays against us. But I agree with some of the stuff that you were saying. I think that what how I interpreted it was it's so difficult to judge the bounce of the ball when it was that windy. Yep. Like the Gogic one where he kind of picks his pocket and then passes to Devlin and Devlin gives him a back and he scuffs a shot a bit wide or whatever. I think in a normal game he'd have picked his pocket and went clean through one-on-one with the goalkeeper, but they were kind of a bit like, oh, where did they go type thing. So, again, it's maybe a bit difficult to judge fully on how they did, but also the other thing is that we asked Forrest and, and Vargas to go play essentially two up front. You know, they didn't have Shanklin there. We've asked them to go play centre-forward up against Gogic and a couple of the other guys at the back for... For St Mirren, uh, no, we're asking them to go get hit. You know, we're asking them to go try and win headers. We're going to ask them to and hold the ball up, etc. And I thought they did. I thought they did really well in that aspect. I, f- I was pretty pleased with how the uh, the front fl- free because the other thing I was going to talk about there, Kev is. I know he's smart, mate, with some people, and I'm not just saying it because I've been dying on this cross for almost a year. But George Grant has to play for Hearts. He makes things happen for Hearts. Well, he was the he was the only creative one yesterday, and you mentioned it. You know, you couldn't play really high balls, not to Vargas and Forrest anyway. That ball over the top, everyone had to be, in my opinion, everyone had to be on the ground and had to be down the channels and in that kind of way of playing. And Grant was really the only one that was was really trying to do that. Um, I did watch a lot of Macaulay Tate yesterday as well, um, and he was making some you know good runs, but for whatever reason, either the ball wasn't getting played to him, or actually he was maybe making the run to take somebody else away and, and open space up, and then that's where you want maybe Cochrane or Devlin to actually start opening and using that particular space. But I thought, I mean, I thought genuinely across the um, across that midfield, I thought they all played pretty well. Um, but Grant is definitely the one that stands out of that particular midfield at the moment, especially when I had to go and chase, his, uh, chase the ball for that corner, which was actually quite funny. Well, I was just about to cut and yeah. cut in on that and and say that like even like on both sides of the ball, Grant uh, I thought done very very well on Saturday. There was a couple of times um, that you'll have seen probably in the highlights if you watched it back uh, on on telly or whatever, then um, where he uses his body really really well. He's like for such a wee guy, right? Is is really like obviously for being such a wee guy, he is quick. Then, but he's able just to get himself into positions to steal the ball away. And I seen him do it twice on Saturday. I was like, well done. 
Like, like absolutely brilliant. And it's good that he can do that, as I say, on both sides of the ball because his attacking prowess is what it is. But you need someone that can also do it when the when the ball's running the other way. And I thought he'd done that brilliantly yeah. on Saturday. I think he suffers. I think he suffers from the same, and we'll come on to Cammy Devlin's opportunity as well. But I think he suffers a bit, or people don't see what he does because he doesn't score goals and he falls into the bracket as well where he doesn't shoot either. There's plenty of opportunities where it opens up for him. And if you're just a bit more confident, I know it's a big thing from Naismith about shooting. You know, it's drilled into the players not to shoot. You know, you give possession away if you don't score, etc. But I think that you, if you don't shoot, you can't score. As, as simple as that sounds. And I think that that's just that next part of Grant's game that, that needs to come. But I think... George Grant, George Grant is up there with Shankland and Cochrane. <clears throat> Frankie Kent is one of the first names on the team sheet for me. I think he's done more than enough to to merit being there. Agree. Talk about then first goal. Ando, actually, when you look at it, you look at the free kick. It's brilliant from Vargas. Uh, takes it down great. Gets a shot away. It's goal bound. I don't know if it's going to go in, but it was good movement. And again, it's something that I really like from Vargas. You would, he's not scared to get stuck in, that, and that's what I like the most about him. Ah, um, plus the position himself, uh, he finds himself in when he makes that shot. You just think, right, that's not like it's not unrealistic. It's like you, you know that he's got it in the locker to be able to do something from that position. You just think, fuck it, go for it. The and that's what the point you've just made about if you don't shoot, you know, you don't score. Them and he isn't frightened to do that, and that's what makes him such a such a class act. Yeah, I thought. Uh, obviously, then we get the penalty. We've already discussed that, Kev. As to <clears throat> it was, we were the other side of the the stadium. Uh, it was pretty much a penalty. As soon as I seen it, uh, it's weird that Vargas. I like one of the other thing I like about Vargas, and it's maybe something that he's learned from his his first few games for Hearts is he doesn't even appeal for it to be fair nice. you know, he's, he's, he's been a bit maybe naive in terms of how he interacts with the referees and other players in the game so it was good to see him just get on with it Cammy Devlin and Cochrane are pretty much the only people that actually go for it well that was that was the one thing that I then started to question myself is because nobody else has really appealed for it yeah, I thought, As I said earlier, like I thought, anyone went for I it I thought it was a penalty I thought it was a penalty, but it might have just been from the point of view of where other players were, angles, all that kind of stuff. Maybe didn't actually see that it did, it did strike his his, um, his arm. So for that point of view, I did find it quite strange. Um, but what else could it have been? Um, you know, from that point yeah. of view, well, we'll not go over um, old stuff, but it comes back to you know the not making a decision by the uh, the gentleman who's supposed to be controlling and uh, refereeing that match. It was definitely one of those situations that you have to be there in the stadium to understand it. Because I don't even think St Mirren, their crowd or the players were that angry about the decision. We've all been in the stadiums when decisions have been ridiculous and everybody's went, oh, that's ridiculous. I think any of the St Mirren fans that were in that side of the park would have gasped and think, oh no. That, that's going to be a penalty and it was one of those ones where I don't know if it's just because I'm obviously right behind the goal almost di- directly at the angle that he tried to hit the shot the way he's jumped in his, his head's here and it, I could see his arm was there and I was like well that's quite clearly a penalty uh, so the right decision first half I thought we, we, we dealt with the conditions very well uh, Riles, Kingsley, Kent <clears throat> are all like you said we talk about the success of this team it's obviously built on the goalkeeper and, and having a solid back back line we look at all of our problems from last season Halkett injured Kingsley injured all the time Rills in and out Atkinson not being able to stay fit it's you know we were chucking Toby Sibic in there every other week you're asking Andy how to play in those positions every other week as well so it's great to have a defensive line that you can rely on, but Ando, the question is, what the hell is Rose then? Where's here? Um, I 
You must have got a set of curling tongs for this Christmas or something, innit? Uh, Buy one, get one free. Uh, I don't know if it's part of some <clears throat> like long-standing bet or something like that. However, the the one thing that people in glass houses shouldn't do is throw stones. Kai Rose has got <laughs> here, um, and obviously I look like, my head looks like a Simonized eggshell, so there's, uh, there's no point in me uh, sort of criticising. However, if I was in a fortunate position to have his hair, I certainly wouldn't be doing that with it. Um, I think it, it does need tuned in. Um, I think someone needs to take him aside and just say, wise up, mate. It's not going to work. It's it's, it's well, terrible. We've already spoke about the games for 1991. <laughs> My mom had that in 1991. <laughs> Go ahead, like the mullet curled, closing a bit of a sovi, sovi chain on. We've covered <laughs> Pat Sharp's mullet. <laughs> he exactly. just went right the way back. He's got the Deirdre for coordinators <laughs> or whatever it is she's for. Uh, tells you how little pressure St. Jo- St. Mirren put us under was it took me about 10 minutes into the second half to realise that Toby Sibick was playing. <laughs> 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 this is more than ever announced at half time. You just yeah, I was it. preoccupied at halftime. Uh, I think. Um, but no, I mean, as I said the other night, no, they did, they did announce it because I was like, why the hell are taking Kingsley off? Um, so, I, so for that point of view, I know that they did do. Uh, so, we had a couple of, ha- Kenny Vargas had a couple of half chances from good play for sort of him, Forrest and Devlin. I actually think one of them the one we spoke about, the Gogic one, I actually think when Devlin passes him the ball back, I think he would have been offside anyway if he'd scored. Uh, I think I thought it at the time, Devlin probably should have hit the shot. Uh, really? But passed, passed the buck and then Vargas put it wide. Vargas had a, a chance where he beat his man brilliantly and the defender actually made a brilliant tackle and the keeper had to just tip it round the post. Uh, and it was the second goal is minging. You know, it's, it's not a good looking goal he's like Tam it's no good looking <laughs> but it was it was absolutely it, it felt and it's one of those things again Ando that I'm not a thing you because you're not allowed to go to the games but in the stadium it certainly felt like if any team was going to score it was going to be us didn't it Aye, I think, or is that Maroon Glasses no I, I think I think you're fair enough uh, obviously I watched it on on Hearts TV and if uh, if, if I'll be honest, the, the way that goal happened was kind of by surprise. I wasn't expecting us to, to score from that turn of play, but the, the momentum was with us, I think. The, it was only really a matter of time until we got the second and arguably probably should have had a third as well, which I'm, I'm sure we'll cover in a wee minute. But the, um, yeah, yeah. The, the momentum was definitely with us. The, uh, I think just the manner of the goal was unfortunate, high wind. Like, but the thing is, play to the conditions. Right, if you're worried about fucking whipping the ball in from a corner like that, play the corner short. Right, just do something different. So, fly with the crows, get shot with the crows. Tough shit. We, uh, it was some defending for us, Kev, wasn't it? Hi, <laughs> it was. Um, it was uh, not an easy. That's definitely not his wheelhouse. That's for sure. <laughs> what was that? You know, it was trying to do. God knows. I honestly don't know, but just before the the corner, I'm because you knew perfectly well that the the wind was coming in that way. I'm screaming at Cochrane just to whip it straight in, and you know perfectly well where his left foot. He's got that, and you know he's got that ability to do it. Just put it straight in every time. And George Grant actually was unlucky about four or five minutes later from the other side with a corner as well. Yeah, you know, and you know yeah. as, as Andrew rightly says, play to the conditions. The wind was blowing and straight in right there. The, we had a corner before we scored, and I remember it because I don't know why, but I was watching Stephen A. Smith, and we played it short. Aye. And to what Ando said, that he went absolutely bananas because obviously you stick it in the mixer and see what happens because the wind could do anything to it. Uh, and then obviously that's that's what we did with the other ones, which was good to see. And then obviously the only other talking point apart from the horrendous defending for their their goal. Is Cammy Devlin? Like, what? <laughs> what? What is? Why is he so scared of scoring goals? He does all the hard work. It's an unbelievable tackle. They send him away, and 
He just, at no point, I was watching him, he didn't even look at the goal. He never once even looked to score. <laughs> he was always wanting to pass that ball. It's like, you know how you see these uh, videos on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, uh, guys who have been hypnotised and start talking <laughs> in like strange languages. I like, where you were going with this, like, but... Uh, like a cool. Martian. I think he's been hypnotised since the, since the fact that he scored two goals against Rosenberg back at the beginning of the season from actually just taking a shot. I think he's been hypnotised by somebody and he's not allowed to shoot any longer. He gets to that point <laughs> and he's he's now all of a sudden going to become a chicken or something like that. It's like me with home games. Aye. Someone's telling him, right, okay, right, you, you've done well here, son. <laughs> You're probably never going to get any better than this. Let's just not even bother. Pass it to a bigger boy. That's valid. Who can do it. That's valid for you, though. Right. That's valid for you. That's fair. But there are those things where <clears throat> that's why people say that we rely on Shanklin. You know, those we need midfielders to, to start chipping in with, with goals from open play. At no point, I think you could fl- play him through another 99 times. I don't think he'll shoot. I mean, I think he was always. Only um, only option in his mind was to was to pass it, and I actually think he picked the wrong pass as well. If you're going to pass there, he should have cut it back to Grant first. Uh, he tried to put it. He tried to put it across the the goal where there was two defenders. Grant sitting penalty spot. The Paul Hartley run where you cut it back to him. If you're cutting it back to anybody, there are the two options: or you shoot, or you cut it back to Grant, and he picked the one that didn't make any sense. <laughs> And then we made a pig's idiot to try and try and force it in, which was which was rubbish. And then their goal, Kev. Where do we even start with? Well, again, goes back to what I said earlier on. Dexter's defending ability um, is not exactly high on his uh, uh, on his list. Um, I did wonder if it was a handball um, just before that, like the guy had actually. It actually hit his arm to put him put it beyond Dexter, um, but the guy also, you know, I don't know what the guy's name is that scored, but shows a bit of strength. Lasagna. Uh, um, he shows a lot of strength. Don't get me wrong, but he should never have been in that position anyway. Um, Dexter should have should have taken him. You could have even said, "Does Devlin? Uh, does Denham take one for the team uh, and just take him out?" I know that's not really the way. Oh, actually, and then you can. Ask I was going to say the only other thing is what's Clark doing. Clark right, seems to stand on his standing that you know in between like two yards off his line. You would have thought he should have been out a hell of a lot quicker than Nardo. Danny, angle, but... Danny, we'll be here all night. Well, aye. Well, let's let's start for the start. I think number one in that situation, I think lack of awareness yep. and naivety for Dexter. Dexter's the last man, right? So he goes again. I've spoke about this with Kyle Rose, the the goal against Rangers at Tyne Castle. As soon as he goes, he only has one option, which is to stop that guy. That's it. So, you win the ball or take him out. I think if he came, smashed him, whatever, you get a free kick, Cochrane's there anyway, it's not going to be a red card, etc. You take one for the team. You, you flatten him, you put him on his you put him on his arse. Or you commit and you win the heater and you put it out for a throw whatever it is. The absolute one you can't do is get beat in the air and then from there it's like you've said well what do we do next does Cochrane bring him down and take one for the team does Denham clip him when there's three of them coming back and they're going to get sent off for that situation or does the goalkeeper actually come out and give the guy an option before he gets in our box I'm not saying he, he comes 25 yards out of his goal but staying on your line with him free running he's Cutting across the defenders because he knows that they can't bring him down. So you're looking for the goalkeeper to come out and start to engage with him earlier than what he does. He stays on his line. He doesn't even. I don't even think he comes past the six yard box by the time the ball hits the back of the net. The guy's got a forty five yard run on it. I, I don't think. I don't think anybody. I think we can. Clark's the last person that you point your finger at because. Dexter should have won it, Coxon should have done Hingway and Denham or who a combination of either of the three of them should have brought him down before he even got there but Clark is, is the fail safe should have reacted better as well Ando Aye, I think uh, there's, there's a, as you say you've walked through it in, sort of, uh, 
in-depth detail there. For me, I think Denham has a Denham has a decision to make when he sees Clark rooted to his line. Um, when he isn't uh, charging out, and th- this is a really shitty thing to say, but I'll say it anyway, is that he's a young lad, right? We can do... If, like, if he chops the guy down outside the box, it takes a red card for it or whatever, then because Clark is planted to his line, I okay, fair enough, you miss him for a game or two. Let's be honest, it's no great shakes, right? As much as I like the guy, he's a young lad, just breaking his way into the team, we can survive without him, right? If Cochrane does that, on the other hand, though, that's different because we're coming into a couple of big games. Them, uh, not the Levy game, but obviously the Rangers game, them, which we'll cover shortly. But the, I think with Clark staying where he is, Denham has a decision to make. He didn't make the right decision. If it had been me, I'd have, I'd have cut his legs away. I mean, you see, another thing, by the way, you see the pace on him to catch up with him. He leaves Cochrane for dust. Like, uh, like off, off the line. Like that, that, that wee lad, I've never seen him really run at full chat before until Saturday. That he is absolutely rapid. He could have got to him and cut him down the ball because Clark's remains planted. It's easy with hindsight, Kev, but there's a, a tiny split window where I think Denham could have slide tackled him just before he shoots. I think he takes not a heavy touch, but his second touch takes the ball away from him. And I think he's got an opportunity where he, he could have potentially slide tackled in. But at that point, the, for me, that you're looking for the goalkeeper to do more than you're asking a 20 year old to do a heroic yep. Beckenbauer slide tackle to to, yeah. to stop a goal type thing. I just thought it was messy from Hearts. I think I think we could. There are times, um, and I think we're sometimes we're also our own worst enemy with regards to the way in which we do defend um, situations like that. Because that's not the first time. I think that's the first time we've maybe conceded a goal in that in that way. But it's not the first time that we've been caught out. From what is effectively our own our own corner, yeah, fair, yeah, yeah. That's what I think. What's disappointing about that is that aspect of it. But then you're expecting an onslaught almost from that point on. But actually, for Hearts, managed the rest of the game pretty well. I think obviously you're looking at the penalty decision is realistically the only talking point for the rest of the game. Is that harsh, Kev, or was there anything that, that, that happened after that that you, you felt well, from, differently? Yeah, just, well, of course, they score. Then, of course, Devlin has his opportunity only within a couple of minutes of them scoring. And that would have put it all to bed and you wouldn't have been sort of worried in the last um, five, ten minutes of the of the game itself. Um, but no, I think I think we we probably, in all honesty, seen the game out pretty professionally. Um, as you rightly say, the only thing was that particular chance of a possible penalty and we've covered that already so it was weird on Saturday I one I never knew that Seba had came on which is weird <laughs> and num- number two I fought for about five minutes because I was like Tagawa isn't he number 29 why is Ta- why is Tagawa changed his number <laughs> and I was like it's not- I-, I-, I wasn't until Chrissy Wilson said to me that's not Tagawa he's like that's Scott Fraser I was like what? I thought I thought when he came on or when Fraser came on, he looked so uninterested in the game itself. Uh, there was no buster runs, there was nothing at all for him. I mean, to be honest with you, I was walking away from the game on Saturday night saying I'll actually pay for him to just fly back down to London for direct for Glasgow Airport. I think uh, there's things that happen with lone players, right? Uh of course. They either come in and they do superb like Cochrane, or they come in and they're there to do a job. And I think it's pretty clear now from the opportunities Fraser's has that Fraser's role in this team is to come in when we're needing things to be shored up a bit with five, ten minutes to go or whatever. I don't, he's not a starter, he's not going to play games, etc. I think he's there just to make sure that the young boys can be taken off when they need to be or fresh legs etc because he's just not a, I'm the which same are, Kev. he's not which I get anything. wholeheartedly get that but when he came in to the team he was also discussing about how he'd love to come back up to Scotland and, and play for Hearts and look at maybe you know an actual signing well if that's the case put yourself in the shop window 
put you, you know, effectively put a stamp on on the games that you do have five ten minutes in or fifty five minutes in. Put a stamp on it. Show what you can do, and ask a question of the actual, you know, the board and the uh, management team to say, "I, do you know what? We want to keep this guy." But so far, I've not seen any of that no, from him at all. I think that's where there's a disconnect because what what the player actually says versus the club's aspirations for him are are, are clearly completely not aligned. Um, and right, right. If, if you're absolutely right. Put yourself in the shop window, but then I, I think to Corbett's point, he's there. What what we're paying for in him is just experience in a tight spot. That's all it is. Which is bring on a guy that knows how to marshal uh, a defence and sail it through choppy water. That is it. Right, and I think you're right. What you say, Kev. You, you want me to come in and put himself in our shop window to get a deal. But when you start to see that actually it's no gone and you see there's more potential and actually get get Tate some game time, let's get Denham some game time because we get more from him. Uh, and I think that's that's ultimately where we're at right now. So, game finished. 2-1 to Hearts. Like I said, 10 victory, away victory of the season. Just for context, we've won 10 away games this season. I think Hibs and Aberdeen have only won 9 games total. So, anybody, anybody, yeah. anybody didn't know that uh, that 16 point swing that they spoke about on .net is completely and utterly fucked Tam must have been on it uh, but we'll move on for we'll move on for that <laughs> Libby Libby All right, here we go Castle. here we go do we talk about it or are we just do I just stay score predictions it's the worst team in the league Surely we're not even discussing anything other than than Hearts victories here, are we? Um, yeah, clearly. Uh, well, if it helps, I, I won't be there on Saturday. Um, so if it's died died in the will, uh, died in the will. What am I talking about? Uh, absolute shoe in that it'll be ten <laughs> nil. <laughs> well, uh, well, I disagree with that, but I no, no, it won't. I get your, uh, I get your point. It'll be it'll well be before the internet blows thing. up and gets upset. Just so that you know, I had the same. I have wore in the combination. I wore the same socks, pants, jeans, t-shirt, jacket, and other jacket, and hat. And we haven't been beat when I've been wearing that combination since the Rangers beat us. Uh, Aberdeen beat us at Petardry. I wasn't at Ibrox, and I wasn't at Ross County, so we are unbeaten. Um. So, what were we talking about there? You know Maybe. the one. I'm that definitely one. is why. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's superstition. And before everybody gets angry, I've been saying two each for about three months and we've won every single game since I've been saying it. <laughs> we, uh, I said we would get beat 2-1 for last week. So, Livingston will beat Hearts 2-1 <laughs> For anybody that's not playing along, you want my prediction, it will be 2 1 to Livingston. Uh, there we go. Right, Ando, give us your score prediction. Um, I will go with uh, Hearts 3, Livingston 0. And one other thing, right, and this, this also coincides with the fact that um, any game that we've won, apart from the games at, at, at Tyne Castle, which is well documented, I'm not allowed back, right? The one game that we did get beaten. Um, I got given a gift, um, and it's here. It's just outside of. Uh, I'll just bring it over here. This right. That got one of these. The only time this has ever adorned myself was the Rangers game. Right. I I'm too frightened to put it on. So if I don't put that on on Saturday, we'll win. That's how it works. It's something that I can never ever wear. I can only ever have it and appreciate it. I'll probably put it under glass and it'll be behind me uh, on the staging going forward. But the one and only time, the day that I put it on was the day we got beat by Rangers. Um, So, yeah. Tells you everything you need to know. I'm not going to put it on on Saturday. Kev, what's your score prediction? I think I think you'll find that Livy will do the Livy thing and stick ten men behind the ball, hump it up front to whoever they've they've got up front, um, and hope to eventually just nullify us as a as a team. 
I actually think it'll be a wee bit tighter. Um, I think we'll be 2-0. Okay, okay. Well, I think that Hearts will put on a show. Um, I've said it before, someday. Duty Scud someday. Shanklin back, Hoff back, Benny back, Kingsley back, playing Barry McKay back in the team, etc. I think that one of these one of these games someday is going to get battered. But it will be 2-1 to Levy on, on Saturday. <laughs> 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 Just for the record, there'll be a Fred on, on kickback tomorrow saying how I said that Levy will win because people can't read between the lines. But I, we're also, I don't know, we're at an absolute conundrum because we're at a page where our, uh, my notebook for all the stuff we write on here, I've got two pages left. So I'm either going to have to take old pages out and try and put new pages in, or I'm going to have to buy a new notebook. Do you write so, or blah, 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 blah. only one page? Do you write front and back of each side of paper? Aye. Oh, okay, cool. Front and back. Shit. Aye, so. Can you write smaller? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to try and line it up so that when we do the preview of the semi-final... I'm going to try and make that my last page <laughs> so that then if we lose, then I can get a new one. Where if we win, then I'll just have to staple bits of paper into it until we win the Scottish Cup. What is, uh, the, is, is, the, is the notebook particularly sentimental? Does someone get you as a gift or, you know, is it a fancy thing? Like, hold it up for a second if you can. No, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a fancy thing. It's just literally... They got, it's just literally just, what we write in for our shows. Just a normal notebook. Right, okay. Just a normal notebook. But if we win and I'm writing in it, then we'll have to keep writing in it. So, but there we go. We can, we'll can we cross that bridge at another time. The, the trials and tribulations of, of, of the Corbett notebook. Mate, honestly, if folk keep the um, unbearable, but it's just the way I, when I stopped doing it, <laughs> Hearts of Liz, told you before. I have put my head like this under my jacket at every cross ball into the box that Hearts have had in the past eight months or every corner. Touch wood, we've yet to concede from a corner. The one time that I thought, no, we'll be fine. We'll be absolutely safe. And I didn't do it. Airdrie scored with a, with a header when I didn't do it. So every single time the ball is looking like it's going to get into the Hearts box, and you're in the Hearts away end, look over because you'll see me literally like that. <laughs> and I'll be doing it until we I do it and we concede or whatever it, it has to do to break the cycle. Breaks that's, the how that's how weird I am. Anyway, that's enough of that. Would it have you any other way? It was good to see you all. See you all next Sunday, where we'll hopefully have loads to talk about, uh, laugh about with our friends from the other side of the city. Hopefully, making a uh, you know what of it for the top six. Anyway, I'll see you all soon, boys. Are it? Catch you later. See you later. Gargoyles. <laughs>